Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon session. Um, the panel we're going to be launching into today is the Downtown Livability and the Challenges in the Center panel. My name is Catherine Keel, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Today's session, we're going to talk uh, about um, discussion around the centers as complete communities for families, seniors, and businesses alike, and look to the solutions and tools that are critical to the recovery and livability of our regional core and community throughout our cities, towns, and hamlets, our community centers throughout our cities, towns, and hamlets. And with us today, we have four panelists, and I'll invite each of them to provide a short introduction to themselves to get us started. So we'll start with Dr. Trimby, please. Hi, I'm Annette Trimby. I'm president and vice chancellor of McHugh, and you might have seen that McHugh, and it's on 104, seven city blocks. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Go ahead, Corey. Uh, I'm Corey Wozniak, I'm managing director at Avis and Young Commercial Real Estate. Uh, Jill Robertson, Dialogue Partner and Landscape Architect. Uh, Susan McGee, I'm the CEO of Homer Trust Edmonton. Great, and apologies for the noise next door, I guess. We'll just have to speak over that. Um, so we're going to get going today, and uh, thank you panelists for your short introductions. Uh, we're going to start with each panelist providing a five-minute short summary of their um, insights and perspectives. And then after the short summary, we'll dive into questions from the audience. So we'll get started again with Dr. Trimby. I thought you said Jill was going first. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so hi, everybody. Um, I, like I said, I'm the president of McEwen University. It's a delight to uh, be here today to talk about housing for all. I really like uh, being a part of a downtown university campus. Uh, I like being in the mix. So a little thing, uh, thing or two about Edmonton that you need to know that differentiates us from other cities. Edmonton has an incredible, strong post-secondary presence right downtown. Uh, Edmonton has uh, been designated by UNESCO as a learning city. Other cities would really like to have uh, what we have downtown. Uh, why is that an important thing for downtown vi vibrancy and viability? Uh, students are 10% of Edmonton's population. And when I say Edmonton, I mean the region. Of our students at McEwen, we have about 20,000 students, and we have plans to grow to 30,000 students by 2030. Norquest has plans to grow, the University of Alberta has plans to grow, Nate has plans to grow, and you know why? Because our economy is growing, and we need talent. McEwen University, we're very fortunate that uh, somebody made a really smart decision uh, many, many years ago to consolidate our campus downtown. And it means our students get to move around from building to building through pedways. It means our students uh, really get to participate in downtown activities. We all know that uh, healthy cities need healthy downtowns. And part of what we learned this morning is uh, cities need to be livable, lovable, and, and prosperous. I like to say that you know we're really lovable. Like I, I think if when when you think back to all of the things that were described this morning about what makes us lovable, make what makes us lovable, having this concentration of young learners is is really a key part of that. We heard Chris Fair talk about how cities have evolved over time, from centers of trade to centers of innovation to centers of transformation. Education is truly transformational. He also talked about how people come to cities to consume experiences, and post second institutions are conveners. They offer a lot of activity, a lot of vibrancy. So our students um, are coming, and they are coming in person. We heard a lot about hybrid work and how people are going back and forth from home. Our students want to be on campus, but they also participate in work integrated learning practicums co-ops, and so they need to travel around the city. And so if you think about it, all of these things are connected. Um, we need talent. Our students need housing, they want affordable housing, they want safe housing, they need reliable transportation because they don't only learn on campus, they learn in our city. We like to think of the city as our campus. All of the things, these things go down together. Uh, I've been told McEwen's an anchor tenant, and I go, I don't really like that language. Anchor sounds like a drag. Uh, but think of us as a source of energy, a source of vibrancy, a source of ideas. So not only do we produce talent, but we produce solutions, and we're going to hear about some of the problems from some of the other panelists that I, I think we contribute to solving. So I, I did want to also highlight that um, our students don't only spend their days on campus. They hang around, they move around, and like I said, they are more than consumers. Uh, they are uh, entrepreneurs, idea generators, you name it. So McEwen wants to be a part of this conversation, housing for all. We don't currently have a problem. 
our residence on campus is full though for the very first time. And I met someone on my board from many, many years ago that said, I, I'm so glad, Annette, that I encouraged McEwen to build that residence because you really need it. Now it's full. But I don't want to build more purpose-built student residences on campus, and I'll tell you why. I think our students will fare better out in community because I, I think that's better for their development. Our students aren't all right out of high school. Our residence is a reasonably good one. It's got two bedrooms. They don't have to have a meal plan. Students like living there. It works maybe for first year, but it doesn't work after that. Also, our graduates are really sticky. Most of our graduates stay in Edmonton, stay in the province, work right here. So we need more diverse, more affordable housing in community. And I was at City Hall this week, and we were having a conversation about one of the levers that was mentioned this morning about uh, office tower conversions. I have a feeling Corey's going to tell you a little bit more about that. That's just one lever. That's one solution. And, um, you know, there were questions being raised about, well, what if we build it and they don't come? I can tell you they're here already and they are coming. We've seen so much data this morning to make that point. So downtown recovery needs people, needs a regular presence, and McEwen is very much a part of that. And we are looking for ways to work with others on solutions to getting ahead of the curve that uh, you know I think is the purpose of this entire event. So thank you very much. 18 seconds to spare. Well done. Well done. That's excellent. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Trimby. So over to Corey, please. All right, <clears throat> let me read you a few things I wrote in a downtown office report. 18% vacancy rate. Government and other large tenants have no use for hundreds of thousands of square feet. And outdated B buildings face the biggest challenge and can't compete in the flight to quality. There's a lack of pride for downtown as it deals with cleanliness issues and uninspiring basic infrastructure. But here's the thing. I wrote that in a report in 1997. So, I, I mean, what's that, what's that famous Mark Twain saying about history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes? Well, yeah, it, it sure does in this case. And what we're dealing with downtown and how we feel about our downtown is a movie we've seen played before. So, how do we get over the challenges then? City Council provided an incentive for every new residential unit added to downtown. The downtown population, when that incentive was launched, in the late 90s was 27,000 people. In the 10 years that followed, 16 office buildings were converted to residential. By 2007, the population was 36,000. Right? Grew by 10,000 people. However, what's unexpected is that if you look at the latest census data, population for downtown as of 2021 only grew by 2,000 people. It's 38,000 people. Right, from 97th Street to 124th Street, so that entire central area. So from 2007 to 2021, it only grew by 2,000 people. But in the 10 years prior to that, it grew by 10,000. So we're sitting at 38,000 people now. Why did the momentum come to a halt? I think many people here will have um, an answer to that question. Uh, perhaps this is the result of the city's focus shifting from scaling up centrally to scaling out to the edges of the city. But what happened to the office market when we focused on a residential strategy during that 10-year period between 1997 and 2007? So vacancy dropped from 18% to 5%. The city's tax revenue from downtown real estate spiked. And new development came onto the scene. So the reason I tell this story is because the same issues exist today. Edmonton has the second highest office vacancy rate in the country. It's at 20% today. We have a serious problem. 10% of the city's tax revenue comes from downtown. Unfortunately, the value of downtown real estate is dropping quickly and significantly. This is a problem for the rest of the city because everyone outside of downtown will be required to pick up the tax shortfall. So we can improve downtown office and residential markets by accelerating our affordable housing strategy. Converting office buildings to residential delivers low cost and mid-market housing. And it does so faster than new construction. The product type is different than what new construction delivers. Since new construction is typically a higher end product at a higher end price point. This is a diversified housing strategy. 
This is an adaptive reuse strategy. This makes our streets feel safer and increases demand for public transit. The incentive that's been recently proposed to City Council has the rare benefit of timing. No incentive would be paid until a project is completed and occupancy takes place. This means the investment doesn't cost anything until 2026 at the earliest. And it's only issued upon success. How many capital projects do you know of that are funded this way? There's no upfront cost. There's no cost on the way through. Only when it's successfully delivered and immediately benefits the community. Thanks. Great, thank you. Interesting that nothing seems to have changed in all that time. <laughs> thank you, Corey. Uh, now over to Jill, please. All right, thank you. We had a hot debate in our prep session about slides or no slides, so I've gone with slides. So we'll pull them up in a sec. Yeah. But don't worry, they're, they're very image-based slides. So I wanted to talk about downtown vibrancy in the context of housing. When we think about housing, it goes hand in hand with vibrancy. And, and Corey and Annette have talked about students and the need to have people living in the downtown. And I'm going to come at it from the placemaking perspective. The Canadian Urban Institute has a, developed a program called Bring Back Main Street. And it's really about how our downtowns and our main streets can respond in the post-pandemic to get vibrancy. And an important element in their strategy is looking at housing. But what is housing without a sense of community? It's just a building. And what is community without a sense of place? And so that's where placemaking comes in. So this image I love as an urbanist, it has a guy drinking coffee with blundstones on, there's a balloon, like it's ticking all of my like, warm urbanist heart boxes. But what it really speaks to is the need to create community and to have that space and place where you can gather, where we can focus on well-being and have places to connect um, and socialize. A big piece of this is investing, as we've heard, into the public realm. And so I have three projects I'm going to walk through. This is Kelly Ramsey or Enbridge Center. It's just a few blocks away. It was completed in 2016, and it was really one of the first transformational public realm projects that was delivered through a partnership between the city of Edmonton and a private developer. The, the city contributed towards a grant for the heritage restoration of the building. The public realm has been implemented in alignment with a lot of the city's plans for a green and walkable downtown. And that green and walkable represents a transition away from the car and towards more human-centric spaces. This has been a really good precedent project because it continues to be a vibrant space and attract uh, commercial tenants and office tenants even in the post-pandemic. The Augustana Tower is a residential development that happened a little bit after Kelly Ramsey. These benches were privately funded by the developer as a contribution back to the city. They actually formed the, the public art contribution of the project. They've been really beneficial because, again, they add spaces for people to sit, and they add greenery to the streetscape. So they provide a benefit to the residents in the tower, but also to the broader community, and help activate and engage people with that streetscape. The last piece I think that I really want to focus on in placemaking is equity and design. This is Canistana Park. This was a City of Edmonton funded project in the quarters. We started the project in 2016 and it was clear with a clear mandate that the park was going to be built before the housing to help spur development. It hasn't happened yet. The pandemic threw a curveball in, in that revitalization strategy, but Kanisna Park has a unique public art feature in this canopy that highlights the indigenous and Chinese histories of the site. I've been told by members of our urban indigenous community, this is one of the few spaces that they feel welcome and included and safe in downtown, and those attributes are a really important part of the conversation. We need to ask who's not at the table, whose voices do we need to consider when we're thinking about designing housing for all. And it's going to be easy to say, well, those were all kind of big city projects with private investment. Well, what about smaller scale municipalities? The same principles around equity and placemaking apply. This is Main Street in Kalmar. In 2021, we did a revitalization plan, or a vitalization plan. This is the Kalmar Bakery. If you want good donuts, go there. <laughs> 
A big piece of this was around Main Street design, but the catalyst was looking at housing. How can even a community like Calmore increase their diversity of housing and get people living on Main Street? And a lot of that emphasis comes from the creation of safe, equitable, and inclusive spaces within the public realm. So some principles just to leave you with as we go, you know, focusing on walkable and safe, green character of place, emphasizing small businesses. These aren't new ideas. Um, Corey probably has a report from 1997 that highlight those. <laughs> but they continue to be applicable even today. And so again, I'll leave you with one of my favorite urbanism photos. This is what we all imagine we want our downtowns to be, and it's achievable. It doesn't matter if you're Edmonton, Vancouver, or Kalmar. You need to do it with your friends. You can't do it alone. And housing is only one piece of the equation. We need to think about it in that greater conversation around placemaking and sense of community. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Jill. So two points of note, Kalmar Donuts and the slide on principles we need to check out, perfect. Uh, so over to Susan. You guys are so efficient. Um, I just, uh, thanks, this is actually really great to be in this room and, and the earlier panels and just having so much alignment in the themes of many of the sessions and I'm gonna touch on maybe a little bit more of the tensions that the issue that uh, I work on every day around homelessness uh, has in kind of the, the broader way we spend our time. Um, uh, I am actually just a, something about myself. I've been with my organization for 18 years. Prior to that, I was with an organization that was the Downtown Development Corporation, different, uh, not a business association, but worked on projects. And I have always lived in central Edmonton during those 30 years, uh, Macaulay, Spruce Avenue. I currently live in Oliver. Um, you know, my, my, my work is really aligned with the idea that I really do believe in a community that is welcoming for everybody, um, but we have some polar, pretty polarizing conversations currently. So I wanted to share that kind of grounding in terms of, you know, my, my daughter's 30 in a couple of months, and her prenatal was in Bill Macaulay Health Center, which is now Radius and doing a bunch of stuff with uh, me as a partner. So it's kind of a cool journey, but it's uh, something that informs the work that I've been doing and certainly how we view as an organization our work. It's, uh, we're often referred to as a system planning organization. We're the community organization that uh, leads Edmonton's community-based plan to end homelessness. And in that, we have a, a lot of, um, res you know, just really trusted with a lot of resources. Uh, we have a budget that has increased significantly through the pandemic and right now fund about $60 million across our programs in a variety of ways. We have been um, shifting, certainly, to a focus on more prevention and diversion work, and at the same time, the core intervention work, which is Housing First, which I really appreciated the shout out this morning about uh, the evidence-based model that it is, as well as we act as a developer and have been developing supportive housing and then working with community partners to deliver services. So a real kind of by any means necessary approach. There isn't a lot that we won't try or do to try to meet our objective to end homelessness, but it also is situating us um, you know, in that system planning role as a planner, um, we have a role, but there's a, there's a limit to what we control, and frankly, even that 60 million is um, a small part of the, the, the sector overall, and certainly the programs needed to, do the, to achieve the goals that we have. Um, the homelessness over time, uh, just in terms of what has happened, I mean, we are a community that has been recognized internationally. Um, we've been written about in um, books around our efforts and how homelessness was reduced uh, prior to the pandemic. Significantly, we had, you know, 20%, if you want to say, kind of, um, uh, vacancy or in other ways to say, you know, typically shelters were not at capacity. But then just prior to the pandemic, a lot of things started to change. So it wasn't just the pandemic. We saw a shelter, a large shelter close um, over that Christmas. Three years, three months later, we were opening the expo. And a ton of things have happened during this time that, um, you know, have really frustrated our efforts. But at the same time, I feel this tension around wanting to recognize the fact that we fund, you know, many organizations that have done Herculean work. Uh, we've continued to house 120 to 140 people per month during, um, during all of that time. But the inflow, the, the increase in homelessness has um, certainly been there. We also have more people experiencing homelessness for the first time. So behind these numbers, we do a lot with data. We drill down and try to really understand what's going on. But some of it is also just not a, not, it's the rest of the system. Again, back to that system. There's folks who reach out to the organizations we work with, our intake partners, because, um, 
you know, they're, they're really dealing with financial poverty, like sustained mental health issues that have now become exasperated. And we've seen the increase in, you know, there's been you know, really personal stories shared with you today about the impact of uh, homelessness on families and addiction particularly, and the um, uh, deaths that um, uh, I don't think anybody would have imagined uh, that we would be dealing with the opioid crisis that we have. So in all of that context though, uh, we have to drill down and say, like, really, what's true? Uh, like, what's true is where we spend a lot of our time. And then what are we doing about it? We have um, this responsibility in a very complex planning environment. The changes that happened and are happening around the role of those system partners like health, um, the perception of community safety and the priority put on safety, and the very clear reality of the encampments and the impact that they are having on downtown. So back to the topic, um, you know, we can't talk about the success of any work we do and you know, gaslight our neighborhoods around the reality of what they're facing and the folks that they are um, you know, trying to be very empathetic with, but it is, it is wearing. And I think uh, where I'd like to kind of think a bit around what we think we know, what we don't know, and how we as a community can challenge ourselves um, with being deep and and, and you know, realizing that this is, we're situating ourselves in a, in a time frame that is not just um, today, you know, there was, I, I appreciate the historic reflection on 97, but you know, we have a housing crisis because we haven't been investing in housing for 50 plus years. Um, we have trauma that is centuries of colonization and uh, the impact of that. We can't go back and change all of that. Um, you know, love harder, have better policies, do better, but we can really reflect on where we are now in terms of the kind of decisions we make because they will be very long lasting. The, um, oh, I hate this, I forgot that that was doing that, sorry. Uh, so these are just some of the signals. I wanna get to this parallel, this, I, it is really um, a focus for strategy right now around the polarization of the environment we're in. Again, it's, there's a lot of alignment. You can feel a lot of empathy with um, a lot of the folks participating in this discussion in here, and I'm sorry I'm over. But one of the things about this polarization is it's, it's really, I, I, this analogy may not work for you that aren't nerds, um, but you know, <laughs> just <laughs> acid and bases are, bo are both like equally toxic, dangerous, and, and, but when you mix them, you also end up with something very neutral and um, in a, it, whatever, salt compound and water. So when we think about that, let's, we have to actually, I'm you know, calling on us as a community to be brave. Um, to be thinking about you know truth and challenging our assumptions because change is really uncomfortable and the kind of change we need to make to repivot our organizations so that we start to realize that change in trajectory and actually start to solve this really complex issue has to be somewhere on the other side of neutral. It isn't about finding the middle and being everybody being happy um, and we and we can't and we won't be able to. Uh, there's a definitely a need to recommit. Our organization right now is updating our community plan. Today and yesterday, we've had community consultations underway, and we've been really focusing on the engagement of lived experience as we've done that work. But it will, um, no doubt, require us to really re-clarify the importance of Housing First, what Housing First is, try on other things, be innovative, and um, I think, again, move a little bit from the crisis orientation and the crisis management that we've been in and what that means in terms of decision making, better governance, longer term strategies, and um, uh, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's great. So uh, thank you, panelists. Yes, applause. Thank you very much. So we're now going to turn to you, the audience, for questions. Um, do we have a microphone in this room for audience folks? Oh, there we are. Super. Hi. What's your name? Charlie. Pardon me? Charlene, fantastic. So Charlene's gonna wander with the mic. So what we'd ask you to do is if you have a question for the panelists, just raise your hand, Charlene will come and visit you. Uh, we'd ask you to stand up, and, if you can, and uh, share your name and who you're with so we get a sense of where you're coming from. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Sean Boley at the City of Edmonton. Uh, my question, I think, uh, is for Corey mostly, but I'm happy to hear from anyone. Um, looking back in your experience, I'm hoping, I was wondering if you could give us a perspective on how changes in financing might change the possibility for development in central areas. So what I'm thinking, and I'm not a finance expert, so I might have some assumptions wrong here. Um, you know, in the mid-2000s, the first decade, there was a lot of condos, and the condo market disappeared. I mean, we saw from the last speaker, everything is purpose-built rental, that is rental that's being built in the Edmonton market. Maybe not everything, but the graph says the majority of it. But my understanding was that uh, 
you know, 10 years ago, seven years ago, somewhere around there, we were seeing for high rise product, we were seeing investment coming from institutional investors that, you know, bond rates were so low, they're looking for a return somewhere. And they're looking beyond the major markets like Toronto and Vancouver and ending up coming out to Edmonton, taking a look at this market. Now that interest rates have gone up and bond rates are following, um, I presume institutional capital's interest in the real estate market will, have, will be down low. And things like MLI Select from CMAC is going to kind of buoy up the, the, the small scale product, but are we going to see investment? Is there still capital for those big scale high rise apartment buildings, whether they're conversions or new builds, um, even if there is sort of demand or market interest for them? Thank you very much for the question. Go for it, Corey. So, um Rentals, you can finance. Condos, you can't finance well. So um, you have to hit a certain number of pre-sales in order for you to have a financeable um, product. And that makes it challenging in the condo market. There's so much front-end work that needs to be done compared to a rental product. So um, delivering a, a, a property to the market that is, that is rental, that's an apartment building, based on pro forma expectations of what the revenue will be like, you can get much more attractive financing up, up front. However, institutions aren't interested in developing. They're interested in acquiring stabilized product, stabilized buildings once they are um, well leased. And so it, we are not getting the institutional attention in the city re regardless right now. They are interested in Alberta, but not in Edmonton. And then when private developers, and often it's, it's local and regional groups, many family offices are the ones who are holding up this industry right now and this economy, they are the ones taking the risk in order to get these buildings built. And once they are successfully stabilized, then institutions are interested in buying them as income producing properties at that point. Great. Can I just add one, one quick point? I, I, I heard this uh, earlier this week that um, the private investors are, are local now, but one of the points I think we need to think about is we've all heard about the, the big gap and we've heard that there are times when things work and times when they don't work. So I, I think we need to continually throw in stock and that stock will vary depending on the financial conditions and the needs of the community. So, so I, I think we can't afford, um, how can I put it? There will, al will always be reasons to be a little afraid, but I, I think we have to make sure that we don't have a boom and bust approach to housing. And we've had a big lull, like you said. You know, there's also been some developers that have looked at, at building condominium towers in, in downtown Edmonton who have then had to divert after getting deep yeah. into their financing strategy and realizing that they, they simply can't move forward with a condo project. Uh, the financing environment is so challenging right now. The amount of equity needed, the, the, the interest rates, the cost to build near record highs. So these are real obstacles. And so we've seen some curiosity about building condominium product and, and they've had to, to, to pivot and go into rental. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions out there, Charlene? Do I see any hands? No, no hands. Wow. Oh, wait a minute. There's one. Fantastic. Um, well, hang on a sec. The microphone's coming to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Kaylin Naden. I'm from End Poverty Edmonton as the new uh, director of lived experience. Um, and I guess, Susan, I just would love if you could also. Um, I guess just provide a little bit more nuance, I think, when we're talking about the new challenges that we're seeing um, with a program such as Housing First. Um, I, I think a lot of markets are saturated right now. It's really hard um, I, when we talk about affordability for all, who is the affordability for? And I've been following along with City Council conversations this week as well. So I just, um, can you provide just a little bit more context? I, I know that obviously, mm -hmm. Um, I, I did work in the front line throughout the pandemic, so I very much mm -hmm. have seen the real challenges that that brought and how that's changed um, the industry and how we approach those things. But are you able to just, yeah, provide more context for other challenges, I think, that are happening, especially with the Housing First program? Certainly. So just for folks, the Housing First program, it's both a philosophy and a program, if you will. Um, it really is about no barrier, uh, low barrier access to housing, connecting people with supports, not requiring compliance prior to housing. Um, but the program itself, itself also relies on us being able to provide rental assistance. Um, we have a, a, a lot of landlords we work with. Those landlords take on a lot of risk when they work with the program. And with that, we mitigate the risk for some of the, our ability to, to pay some damages and to ensure rent is paid and manage that relationship. But it is complex. And so in this market, 
what we find is that folks typically will, I mean, we'll, we'll see that boom bust cycle and it impacts things like where people go down in the market. So where availability, uh, um, we've had that great relationship. We've been, we currently like tonight are paying over a thousand people's uh, part of their rent uh, that are supported right now in, in a case management role. But being able to access those units when um, more, um, uh, I guess, desirable tenants, if you will, and that you know would be able to get their housing on their own, start to take more of those units off the market. So there's no good time to be homeless economically. I mean, there's no great market to be homeless in. And we get the different question whether it's a boom or a bust. But in this cycle, one of the things that happens is we just have less available stock because others are going down in the market. And um, I think some of the other challenges with that that... Uh, you know, it, it, it is, there are compounding effects. It, I described a system, and I'm sorry to belabor this, but some of it is like you're going to have to like calibrate stuff mm -hmm. so it works, but when it gets too bottlenecked in some area, we find we're spending a bunch of time on rework. And right now, the need is so high, um, we get criticized, and you know, I'm really comfortable with criticism, so, um, but it's, you know, the fact that we do have folks coming back into the Housing First program after a few years of stable housing, and they're homeless again. Is that a failure of the program? Why are we bothering in the first place? And some of the work that we do about you know, not being able to maintain contact with individuals, and some of the, the statistics around losing contact people with during a housing process, um, you know, it's pretty high, like, you know, 50% of folks during a year, and that's um, part of that narrative that we, you know, it really frustrates the process. But the other side of it is we maintain contact with 50% of the people that are otherwise living in chaos, many without resources, many without a phone. So there's a really positive inverse to that um, in spite of all of those things. But one of the things specifically in our environment right now, is, you know, related to the question around access to units is, is that there is, it, it is a really challenging time to continue those partnerships with landlords that, you know, it's the, not just inflation, but just the, the cost of repairs, the ability to turn over a unit if we um, have to support that process, have gone up considerably, and our funding hasn't gone up proportionately. Great, thank you very much. Do you have a follow-up? Is there a place um, where you work together with that? Absolutely, yeah, most certainly. The, the development community is ready to partnership with um, the, the, where the demands exist. And so at all levels of affordable housing, whether it's student or other um, uh, special interests that, that need more diverse housing options, um, conversion is, is absolutely a, uh, a really key path in order to deliver the product that's required faster. Great, thank you. Great, there's a question at the back and then there'll be one here at the front after that. Charlene? Hi, uh, Earl, <coughs> excuse me. Earl McKenzie with BOMA, um, question for Corey, and I'll preface it by saying I'm new to the industry. My question's probably naive, if not outright stupid. Um, with the strong push to create residences downtown, is it conceivable you reach a tipping point where business says, well, we're not welcome here and, and flees to the industrial parks? So businesses need more than just office employees filling our downtown properties, right? So, you know, there's great debate around how to get more people wanting to work in the office longer. But a vibrant downtown is not reliant only on its corporate presence. You know, we have to shift away from thinking of our downtown as a central business district. It has to be thought of as a central social district, mm -hmm. right? So we, we need, we absolutely need to, um, Think about our neighborhoods of, of opportunities for vibrancy. And you know, our, our, um, our business attraction groups, you know, they are working really hard in terms of trying to get a 100-person company or 200-person company to move to Edmonton and set up shop and hopefully maybe downtown. But you know what's really interesting? We have, I'm sitting next to this incredible champion for downtown. Between McEwen and Nate. Norquest. And Norquest, sorry, thank you, at Norquest. So McEwen and Norquest, 15,000 more students. They've already announced plans. And then Nate and U of A also have announced plans for thousands more students. We always focus on the students, but we, all, we forget that there's also staff required to deliver the services to those students. So we have this incredible population growth that is happening right here. And we spend all our time focusing on the business attraction opportunities. We know there's 15,000 more people that are going to be coming downtown. These, these students want to be a short commute from campus. That should be our focus. That's an incredible opportunity for us to create vibrancy. 
the education and opportunity. Start businesses. Yes. <laughs> well, and they do. I mean, that you know, what what an incredible opportunity to have have the. The, the focus on the on the on the learner strategy, the young adult strategy, they can become the fabric of our downtown community. They go from education to work to socializing to renting the first co uh, apartment and buying the first condo. Um, the, the the you know it's the young adults, it's the students that want to be present in class. The you know it's it's they can transfer from a from a highly social engaging learning environment into a highly social work environment. So, you know, it's the cycle that I'm clearly passionate about. Great, thank you very much. Question at the front. Nice. Hi, I'm Christopher Batra from the Right at Home Housing Society. Um, we usually focus on challenges and issues, so I'd actually like to take a Susanism um, <laughs> and ask everybody what really kind of their big, hairy, audacious goal is. So kind of the past the horizon 10 year goal that you would like to see centered for increasing the livability of our downtown. Mm. So that's a question to each of you. I think Susan should start because it's a Susanism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming from a graduate of Homer Trust, <laughs> Chris, um, I, I, I think you know, we, there's a lot of programs and there's targets, and we're very like kind of uh, oriented towards that. But ultimately. Um, you know, we talk about homelessness being brief, rare, um, not recurring, but really being in a community where it's abhorrent and really uncomfortable that we have uh, folks that are houseless in our community. Um, you, don't, you don't look at somebody in a car beside you with their kid in the front seat while they're smoking, in their front seat while they're smoking, <laughs> without a seatbelt on and not think, oh my gosh, I should call somebody. Um, we should have that same response and the normalization of kind of how do we, you know, our pro even, even in programs, it's really hard not to normalize, like just we're getting up and dealing with uh, this really uh, significant monster of an issue. But if we keep our eyes on that longer term, how we should be really uncomfortable with any of it. Great, thank you. Jill. Yeah, um, for me, I think the word that resonated in both what Susan said and what Corey's previous comments were about community. And I think that in order for us to really tackle some of these big issues. It's about creating that sense of community. And so how do we make spaces that are inclusive, safe, welcoming for all, add vibrancy? We want people to want to choose to live downtown. And we spend a lot of time creating community out in the suburbs. There's community leagues, there's community centers, we invest there. We don't seem to put the same emphasis in the downtown core. And so I would really love to see an, an intentional focus in creating community down, in downtown Edmonton that is for everyone and addresses um, health, socialization, well-being, all of these different domains. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we, we can get 10,000 more people living downtown. Um, we can get um, uh, a more successful office marketplace that is worth investing into. Um, you know, we, we need to course correct the office market. We need to actually fix the residential market. And so that's, that's the irony of it. Uh, more, more people, more vibrancy, safer streets. You know, I just think we can focus, you know, on on social attractiveness and education as the as the quick levers for us. You talk about ten years, but I think that, you know, it's it's such an easy um, path forward, and we know where the demand is, and we're somehow making it harder for us to chase something that is smaller and less impactful when we've got this incredible opportunity that is known and ready for us to do something about. Great. A vibrant downtown. Okay, more than that, downtown Edmonton world-class river running right through it, an education district, museums, sports teams, and nightlife. Nightlife. Thank you. Somebody has to open a bar. <laughs> There's a question way at the back, Charlene, as well, after this question here. Uh, my name is Chelsea Rudolph. I'm from the city of Leduc. Um, my experience with urban centers is more in these, I'll call them smaller yeah. urban centers. So um, currently in Leduc, was pre previously working in Stony Plain, who are known to have more, I'll say like historic downtowns that have had less investment and I don't want to say less growth, but obviously not to the same extent as city of Edmonton has seen as quick evolving evolution over time. Um, so my question is really around like, any advice you have for like first steps or you know what should we tackle first as communities of these sizes are starting to do area redevelopment plans where we're rethinking an entire urban center 
at once where we're talking about land use, public realm, uh, housing, commercial, institutional, like you have all of these different pieces that are, you're kind of trying to think about them at the same time. Um, so any advice from your perspectives on, you know, what would be a good first step or to really start change in a positive way? Thanks. I'd like to take that one first. Sure, I can jump in. Um, I think the first step in is doing something like an area redevelopment plan that looks at the multiple facets of this. The Kelmar revitalization plan you know, considered public realm, but it also looked at economic development and housing diversity and, and community engagement. That is a big piece of it. So I think that a lot of the plans that are really successful are reflective of the community and are built by the community and that's how you get that sense of ownership and commitment to see it forward. I worked on lots of plans that have sat on the shelf of the planner at the city and have never to be seen the light of day and I've worked on lots that have become dog-eared dog and you know, marked up and council carries them around in their pockets. And I think it is really because the ones that are the most successful are built by the community and with the community. So, you know, my encouragement would be to start a public discourse and ask people in Leduc what's important to them, what are the priorities for, for your community, and that helps to create that excitement and interest and, and commitment to advancing these plans forward. There you go, great, thank you very much. Oh, anybody next, did you wanna say anything, Corey? No? Okay, great. No, I, I, I oh, might want sorry. to add one piece, Go and that it. is, uh, what about Leduc is unique and special? We sort of know what about Leduc is unique and special it relates to oil and gas, but what's the new <laughs> going forward thing that you want people in Edmonton to hop in the cars and go to Leduc and spend an afternoon doing? Uh, and I, I realize it's not just about people coming to Leduc, but that does help the people in Leduc if there's something cool and interesting that draws people in. Mm, good point, thank you. Great, and question from the back. Uh, Mary Rose CUI, I, I um, just have one reservation about the Central Social District uh, replacing the Central Business District. You know, I just want to remind us of our history. Cities are millennia old and they're organized around the economy. That's why a city exists. And I appreciate all the things people are concerned about, about quality of life and livability. All of these things are enabling conditions for us to work and make a contribution. But we can't forget that the reason cities have emerged and, and the communities that surround them is because of economic activity. And I don't want us to lose that. I worry that we forget this, that fundamentally that's the ingredient and all of us are trying to make sure that the conditions are there for those to thrive and to be inclusive. But we have to be focused, don't we, Corey? We can't just say, oh, you know, cities are not about just real estate, they're about transactions and interaction, just like Annette students and her faculty and all the work you guys are doing. We can't, I don't want us to soft pedal this. We, an apple rots from the core. That's why downtowns are so important. End Great. of rant. Did you want to address that, Corey? Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. And you know, and I see a social strategy as an economic strategy. So I agree with you fully. And you know, when I think about when I started in the industry, main floors of buildings would charge a premium rent Landlords could get a lot more revenue from the ground level, and today it's a loss leader, yeah. mm -hmm. right? You could get more, um, if you were more successful in getting your tower filled, you can get more rent at ground level. Now you actually need to get the right occupants on ground level, even if it's at zo zero cost, just to try and get more people up in your tower. So ground level, street level is now a loss leader, and so it's completely inverted. Right, and it all starts about trying to create that, that street level activity in order for us to even begin to have success up in the towers. Hmm. Great, thank you. Anybody else want to say anything about that at all? Yeah, and I, I just think I would add that goes back to the question about, you know, prioritizing housing or business. You have to prioritize both because you're not going to have a vibrant downtown if everybody leaves at five o'clock, but you're not going to have a vibrant town if nobody's working down there. So we have to be talk targeting both. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? Nothing, right? You're processing. There's so much information you're processing. Earlier I was going to say, wow, there's so much here for us to think about. So if you're pausing for a moment to think, uh, maybe I'll pose a question to you all. Um, when we think about, um, you know, the things that we're thinking about here in Edmonton for housing, development, downtown, vibrancy, et cetera, what are you seeing or what have you seen across Canada or in other markets that could be something we could be thinking about here? Is there anything you've seen that would be interesting to throw out to the audience for them to consider? Go ahead, Annette. At the risk of um, mentioning my former city, because 
I'm really an Edmontonian first and foremost, but I have had stints in Winnipeg. Uh, one of the things I was able to do there as a university president was work with a development corporation that we created arm's length to the university, and we worked with developers who wanted to um, get involved in projects that maybe didn't meet the market conditions, and we accessed inexpensive federal funding and social impact bonds, all sorts of things, and we actually created three mixed income towers where we had people living in them with rent supplements, people that had affordable rent. We, we, we didn't differentiate, and, and so this created a you know, really, really interesting community opportunity, I think, for people to get to know one another and understand inclusivity. So I, I don't know what would work here, but sometimes I, I think there's a tendency to want to segment people a little too much in Edmonton. And I know that um, you know a lot of um, residences are designed where first-year students live with first-year students, graduate students, and so on. And I'm a real big fan of multi-generational, multi-income, very diverse, very inclusive. So you know, I hope we can experiment somehow with that uh, in Alberta. Great, thank you. Any comments from anybody else? Um, so one of the things, I, we're often a leader in our community. I mean, Edmonton is often a leader, and I think that there's also opportunities to look at um, you know, where, where we don't want to be and look at some of what has happened to other communities where folks who need to be employed and drive some of that social environment, that the, the restaurants, all the services that we want in our library downtown are often not high paying jobs. Um, and as the actually in our sector, in Vancouver for instance, people on the front line doing social work and support that's very necessary might commute two and a half hours because they just can't afford to live. So it's a very different type of commute issue when they're low paying jobs, but that's, that's their work and they're spending that much time in court. So some of those folks have actually created co-ops and created like trying to trying to look at creative housing opportunities close to the core for affordability, not just because my folks that I'm working with need it, but if we're going to have those uh, you know really dynamic environments with restaurants and other services, we also need people to work there and right. to make sure that the affordability captures them as well. Great. Thank you. Jill or Corey, anything? Yeah, I would just, I think that um, Edmonton, I'm not from Edmonton, but I've been here for 10 years, and what always strikes me is that Edmonton isn't afraid to take risks, and I think a lot of the challenges around housing are gonna require innovation, they're gonna require us to think outside of the box, and we have the opportunity to move the needle pretty impactfully here, and there's a lot of smart people in this room and in this city, and I, and I would just encourage us to not be afraid to continue to take those risks to solve some of these challenges. Great, Corey, any thoughts? You know, we, we um, I think about Calgary has, has three incentives right now to try and stimulate more activity centrally for them. And they have their, their uh, office building conversion incentive that's oversubscribed and, and you know they have 13 buildings underway now and another four that are in the queue um, going through due diligence. Um, highly successful and it's a model Toronto now is, is looking to emulate and many other cities. Um, Toronto's announcement was yesterday. So you, um, then they have two others, a demolition incentive and a uh, post-secondary incentive. I don't agree with the de demolition incentive, I find that very odd in, in this, in this uh, environment, but they have uh, an incentive to try and attract education downtown, and we don't need that. And that is an amazing gift that we have, and you think about, um, we call ourselves, you know, as the capital city, the largest employer is the provincial government. We actually have more people who go to school every day at McEwen and Norquest than we have provincial government employees. Hmm. If you took all the employees and staff, uh, students of McEwen and Norquest, they would fill half of all the buildings in downtown Edmonton. That's the profound impact. So if you put them into the vertical buildings, they would fill all, uh, half the buildings, and they just happen to be you know, spread over how many blocks? Seven blocks? Seven. So you know, seven blocks away from here, yeah. over a seven block stretch, um, there's, this, there's this incredible gift, and Calgary is incentivizing, incentivizing post-secondaries to, to uh, bring their students downtown. So again, you know, we think about students, um, you know, many of these students at these, on these campuses, they, um, many of them don't have a car. Many of them don't have a driver's license. They are very comfortable with pu public transportation. They're prepared to walk further. They will be on our um, bike lanes and riding our public transportation. We just gotta get them living downtown. 
Hey, and, and I, I, I want to note that you know Edmonton always talks about being young, educated, and growing. And so this learner city, this advantage we have, we need to leverage it. But I'm also mindful of Mary Rowe's point about, okay, okay, where's the wealth creation downtown? Uh, and I, I, I think I just want to put in a plug. A lot of our students graduate and they want to create startups, they want to work in SMEs, and you know, we, we have to think a little bit differently about how wealth is created. And, and yes, some of those jobs will be relatively high paying and others will not be, but I, I think we can't forget the economic impacts of our graduates in our city, and ours happen to stick around, and if we can get them to live in the core, but I'm also looking at Leduc, and you know, there's other places too as well, right? There's uh, great opportunities for some flow back and forth. Great, thank you very much. We have time for one last question. If anybody has anything burning before we have to depart for our next session. Okay, one last question. You're gonna get in right at the end. Thanks, uh, my name is Ty Ziola. I'm an architect and a partner of Jill's at, at Dialogue. Um, and I, I guess my question uh, is, you know, we, we've heard a lot of talk about, you know, how, how do we actually stimulate uh, the kind of investment and the kind of risk taking that um, that it's going to take for uh, for development of a, maybe a broader range of affordability of, of different units, right? And it, it seems like right now the the models that we're relying on are um, you know either um, nonprofits are having to go through this lengthy um, grant application, very competitive grant application process that is really prohibitive in terms of producing the, the kind of quantity we want of, of units um, that are on the affordable end. Um, or we're, we're looking to market developers to build uh, really nice housing and, and believe yeah. there's, a, there's a market for higher end housing and that will somehow cause a filtering down, right, of, of um, you know, more affordable units to, to other sectors of the population. So I guess I'm wondering, like, like what, what are our options outside of the, those two, mm -hmm. two um, models to, to actually start producing more housing? Maybe that is geared at, you know, McEwen and Norquest students or, um, you know, and, and I, I really like the office conversions idea. I think I think that's one you know that's one possibility. But like, who who are the people, um, and and how are we kind of helping um, mitigate their risk, like to, to that tipping point where where it's something they actually want to engage in, right? Thank and you. you can do. Sorry, I've got to cut you off there because we're running out of time. But I think there was a lot of questions in there. But I think what I heard is the the top end question there was how do we incentivize the risk taking that you're talking about? Maybe Jill, and if anybody else wants to answer, and then we'll. We'll wrap up after that question. I, I just want to jump in quickly. So part of this is about vision, and the vision has to go beyond the core. We have to think about the whole region and a housing strategy for the whole region. Mm -hmm. And the other part is how to de-risk, because obviously the market alone won't do it, not-for-profits can, alone can't do it. So I, I think we need by intent to create some innovative partnerships mm -hmm. as part of the overall housing strategy. And the situation I described in Winnipeg did just that. Great. Thank you. Corey or yeah, Jill? You know, I, I think there, there just has to be this continued partnership dialogue with, with our city. Uh, right now, we're, we're in a really challenged, you know, cost environment, you know, with deficit situation with the city and, and the fact that I, I think there is um, uh, a lack of urgency and an unwillingness by some members of council right now in order for us to, to see this as an urgent opportunity for us. This needs to be a partnership approach with the development industry to deliver the product that we know the community needs. Great. Thank you very much. Jill, did you want to add anything? Or? No, I would just echo, I think that, that private-public partnership is key because that is how we're going to manage the risk, get the houses to the people that need them, and create that vibrancy that we've been talking about. Super. Thank you very much. I'm gonna, I, I, I think it's really important that we not dilute ourselves, that there's special math, um, and that some housing can be created without the necessary investment, and that investment's going to be public. And I think we, we, we you know, my, throughout my career, I've seen a lot of wasted time on pro formas that just are never going to work without the support. And, like we, 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 and that's not to negate how excited I get about really innovative housing partnerships, and there's a whole range we need, mm -hmm. but some of it just actually does need that level of support. We heard about Finland. Finland's success is very much connected to its investment in social housing. Super. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to take a moment to thank our panelists. Everybody give them a round of applause, please. Uh, there may have been other questions that have come up in your mind while we've been chatting this afternoon. Our panelists will be around this afternoon, in and out. So if you find them, you can ask them your questions directly. Uh, but I'd like to thank them. And uh, on behalf of the MRB, thank you all for being here. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for your questions. And now you've got a um, short break. 
before we have to get to our next session. So you've got a short coffee break for the next maybe 12 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody.